last time we met, we ended <coughs> the section of Leviticus chapter 11 that discussed the subject of animals that were divinely declared permitted or prohibited, clean and unclean, for food. And further, we talked about the hopelessness of trying to determine why certain animals were set apart as permitted or clean, others prohibited, unclean, and that we're gonna, we would do best to simply accept the Lord's selections as an act of his sovereign will. And due to the content of chapter 11 and its focus on Hebrew dietary rules, it's opened up the monumental subject of ritual clean cleanliness and holiness. Now we're going to continue that exploration today because it plays such a vital role in God's plan for his creation. Further, we really need to get a handle on this so that we can understand statements about purity that are also in the New Testament and as they are meant to be understood. Now we've discussed several aspects of uncleanness but now I would like to briefly address this question. Is uncleanness the same thing as sin? In a word, no. But uncleanness can be a product of sin, even if it's not always the case. As we're going to see in the following chapters of Leviticus, uncleanness is produced in a woman by her monthly cycle, even by childbirth. There is certainly nothing sinful in any of that. Uncleanness is produced by contracting a skin disease, often incorrectly called leprosy in our Bibles. There is certainly nothing necessarily sinful in that, yet typically the scriptures tell us that this skin disease is an outward sign of a hidden and inner condition of sin or uncleanness. I'd like to leave the matter of how uncleanness relates to sin for a couple more chapters later in Leviticus, but for now just go forward with the understanding that sin and uncleanness are not two words for the same thing. Do not equate sin and uncleanness in your minds. What is important is that Jehovah's holiness must be and it will be protected and separated from all uncleanness. Now today I'd like to begin to address the matter that I'm sure most of you have been waiting for. Do the kosher eating laws still apply? And if they do, to whom do they apply? Do the scriptural dietary laws apply to Gentile believers or maybe to Messianic Jews or maybe to nobody for that matter? Just like everything else we do in Torah class, we're not going to approach this in a simplistic yes or no manner because I hope you're beginning to see this. This bottom line approach to God's principles is Greek style thinking. And it runs completely counter to the design and thought style, the Hebrew thought style of the Bible. The truth is found in patterns that are set down beginning in Genesis that run right on through Revelation. The truth is not found in a verse or two that we hope will just plainly state what we're seeking as though the Bible is a dictionary or an encyclopedia. I'd say that there is a near unanimous agreement within the modern church that for a variety of reasons the kosher eating laws of the Torah do not apply to the followers of Christ. The primary reason usually cited for that is that the belief that Christ abolished the law. He abolished the Torah, we're told, of which the dietary laws are central. Therefore, whatever was ordained by God 
before the birth of Yeshua, we can just wave our hand and make it all go away. We say that all that scripture before Yeshua just disappears. We don't need to revisit that territory. I've demonstrated to you time and time again here in Torah class that Christ in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 17 through, test, uh, through 20 personally and strongly stated he did not come to abolish the law and that anybody who teaches that he did is going to be called what? Least in the kingdom of heaven. And anybody who teaches and obeys, that word is there, I'm not adding it, teaches and obeys the law will be called greatest in the kingdom of heaven. You decide which side of that you want to be on. Now since this is such a contentious matter, we're going to begin examining it today and we're going to go on into next week as well. But in order to draw this lengthy, lengthy subject of kosher eating towards some kind of a conclusion and end up with some kind of a guideline that we can begin to work with in our lives, I'm going to take the unusual approach, at least it's unusual for me, of giving you my conclusion right up front and then demonstrating to you how I arrived at that conclusion. But in all candor, I have to preface it by invoking the words of St. Paul as he was teaching the Corinthian believers on the thorny subject of marriage and divorce. In paraphrase, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 7, 7, Of what I'm about to tell you, I must confess, this is what I think. I'm not entirely sure that it's from the Lord. So take it for what it's worth. So with that understanding, here we go. I am completely persuaded that Christ did not abolish the Torah or the law. As he said, not even a jot or a stroke, not one iota of it. And therefore, it's incomprehensible that he could have abolished the sacrificial system and the dietary laws that were part and parcel with the sacrificial system and so central to the total body of holy instruction that's called the Torah. Yet undeniably, something's changed. A great transformation in how Torah operates took place upon his death and resurrection and the coming of the Holy Spirit. And much of the laws of the Torah are not in force because so many of those laws are dependent on the existence of a physical temple and a physical priesthood, Levitical priesthood, that currently does not exist. But they're going to, again, in the near future, after Yeshua's return. And we are told that explicitly in the Bible. And as concerns the sacrificial system, the greatest transformation was that Yeshua took on every requirement of that system. The high priesthood, the rituals, even the sacrifices themselves. But he took upon his shoulders those sacrifices that make atonement for sin. Recall, there are five categories of sacrifices. Only two of them deal with sin. All the rest are for other things, like thanksgiving, free will offerings, things like that. He didn't satisfy the sacrifices that are made for vow offerings, for uh, peace offerings, for free will, for thanksgiving offerings. But make no mistake, the spirit and the purpose of Torah's sacrificial system is alive and well in that Christ's innocent and purest blood is still required every moment of every day to atone for our sins, just as an innocent animal's blood was required to atone for each sin committed before his coming. The spirit and purpose of Torah's ordained priesthood is also still alive and well in that Yeshua now wears the mantle of high priest. He is our permanent mediator in heaven 
Why do we pray in the name of Yeshua? He's our mediator. And he does this just as the descendants of Aaron used to be human high priests and mediators for Israel. And we as his followers are now from a spiritual standpoint compared to over and over again in the New Testament what? Common priests. By means of trust in Yeshua we're set apart. We are sanctified. We are declared holy. Yeah, you. You are declared holy for service to God. Just as certain designated families within the tribe of Levi were, sacrificed, were sanctified and set apart to officiate the sacrificial rituals, to serve God Almighty in a whole variety of ways in times past. Now the Torah, which is the divine ideal, that began as purely heavenly and spiritual in form in the beginning, in the beginning, was the Word. In the beginning, the Word was with God. In the beginning, the Word was God. It eventually became an earthly and physical system of rule and ritual when Jehovah gave it to Moses and Israel at Mount Sinai. And then, some 1300 years later, at the foot of the cross, that system of rule and ritual took on more aspects of its original heavenly and spiritual nature. Sacrifice never ceased to be required because as long as sin exists, sacrificial atonement must exist. But now, the only sacrificial blood capable, capable of producing atonement is Yeshua's. The priesthood has never ceased to be required because God has always established, set apart human beings to carry out His will and to serve Him, whether they are angels or whether they are humans. But for our era, those set apart and sanctified humans, the priesthood, they're believers for now. And as concerns the dietary laws, kashrut, there are foods, there are other things that are still prohibited and permitted, clean and unclean for us. Yet, that too has transformed and it is no longer to be taken in the purely physical, earthly, ritualistic sense it was at one time. Now it is returned, partially, to its spiritual, heavenly ideal. Still another dynamics involved in the transformation. Because man is this strange combination, aren't we, of the physical and the spiritual. We're the only living creature that's like that. The manifestation of Torah ideals and principles is, ne is, uh, is necessarily a combination of the spiritual with the physical, the invisible with the visible. And because in the current state of the universe, the clean and the unclean, the sinfully corrupted physical and the perfectly holy spiritual, it all lives together side by side. Therefore, the the Torah still has a physical, earthly nature to it that accompanies its spiritual nature. I've explained this mysterious deal on a number of occasions by using the term the reality of duality. That is, we, we live in this sort of parallel universe whereby the spiritual and the physical exist simultaneously. It is not a matter of one or the other as Greek thought must have it. The phenomenon of the reality of duality is not explainable in scientific terms. It's only explainable in faith and in God patterns. Patterns that have come from the mind of Yehovah, not from the minds of men. So in a nutshell, although the dietary laws have not 
been abolished. Something is different as a result of what Jesus did. And at least part of that something that he did is that trust in him trumps any kind of mindless, legalistic obedience to physical, earthly rituals, especially when it comes to salvation. Now let me emphasize that. Faith overrides obedience as concerns gaining salvation. Yet that in no way says that obedience to the Torah, which is the mind of God, is somehow obsolete. Our salvation is 100% dependent on trust that Christ's work on our behalf is the one and only thing that makes us acceptable to and having peace with Jehovah. Yet, and this is where the church has fallen flat on its face, obedience to the Lord's Torah still matters. It's relevant. In fact, the result of our salvation ought to be, and is expected to be, obedience. Where is our gratitude to Jehovah if we think obedience to his eternal Torah is now passé? How is he our Lord and Master if we're obedient only to ourselves? It is true, thank God, that the condemnation, the curse, the Torah pronounces, which is eternal separation from God, is now dead for those who trust in Christ. But never doubt that that same condemnation is alive and well for those who do not trust. Also never doubt, and this is made clear by all of the apostles, that the blessing for those who are in Christ and who obey the Torah remains. Am I saying that those who determine to obey Torah are going to receive blessings from above that are th th that those who are indeed saved but don't obey them will not receive? You bet that's what I'm saying. Is there blessing from following the dietary laws? Without question there is. But is following kosher rules required to gain or even maintain our salvation? Absolutely not. On the other hand, is following the dietary laws without trusting Christ of any use? The answer is absolutely not. Obedience to Torah apart from the trust in the Lord, our trust in the Lord, is utterly worthless. It's worthless. Other than our own personal gain of eternal life, what good is salvation apart from obedience to the one who saved you? Christ and Torah exist together. They're inseparable. Christ, we're told, is the Word. The Word is the Torah. Trust and obedience exist together. They're inseparable. Trust gains salvation. Obedience gains blessing to those who trust. Now let me show you why I've come to those conclusions by looking at a couple of places in the New Testament where it's often taught that kosher eating was abolished, at least for Gentiles. Now let me remind everyone listening that this, this discussion we are having is all based around Leviticus chapter 11, which puts forth the dietary rules for Israel. Turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. We're going to start reading at verse 9. Acts chapter 10. This is the famous story of Peter and the Roman army officer Cornelius and this sheet full of animals that's being lowered down from heaven in, in, in a vision for Peter. Starting at verse 9, about noon the following day as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up to the roof to pray. 
He became hungry. He wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven open, something like a large sheet being let down to the earth by its four corners, and it contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles of the earth and of birds of the air. And then a voice told him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. And the voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times. Immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. Now while Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out, asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. And that is usually where the story is stopped during a sermon or a Bible teaching on this subject and then a teacher or a pastor says what could be more plain God sends many animals to Peter in a vision and by all accounts these were the unclean forbidden animals and tells him it's okay to eat them therefore it's obvious that God has removed the unclean label on them and it's the end of kosher eating well not so fast the first thing we should notice is that as of verse 17, Peter had come to no conclusions, conclusions as to what this, verse, this vision even meant. He was confused by it. He had to think about what God was trying to tell him. And several verses later, in verse 34, Peter explains that while at first he thought this was about kosher eating, he now understands it wasn't at all. When he says, and starting in verse 34, then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. Peter says the vision was about accepting men from every nation, Gentiles, who trusted in God, believing them, uh, uh, bringing them into the fold of believers. Anyone, regardless of their ancestry, was to be eligible for salvation through Jesus Christ. As Peter says, no favoritism. So according to the apostle who wrote the actual scripture of the book of Acts, we can throw this story out as an example of a New Testament instruction to abolish the kosher laws of clean and unclean animals. As Peter finally figured out, this vision had nothing to do with food. It had to do with men. Food was being used as a metaphor representing men because Peter went to sleep dreaming about food. Remember what he said? Peter says, I'm hungry. Says, oh, and while he was hungry, he fell asleep while food was being prepared. So he was dreaming about food. Peter was hungry. The unclean animals were simply a very familiar, well-understood Jewish symbol of the spiritual principle of uncleanness and of the status of Gentiles. It had to do with the Jews shunning of Gentiles. In this case, it was Peter's reluctance to bring the good news to the Gentile Cornelius because Jews regarded all Gentiles as unclean. Or as Jehovah said in the books of, book of Acts, don't call on clean that which I tell you is clean. But let's take this another step. Exactly who is it that's being referred to here as clean, who was formerly unclean? Gentile believers. Up to now, only someone who physically joined Israel, a foreigner, a Gentile who gave up his former allegiances and officially became a Jew, only he would be considered by the Jewish people to be clean. But now, in some mysterious divine way, some Gentiles have been joined to Israel and therefore been joined to Israel's covenants with God without physically and officially joining Israel. Israel. 
And when we look back in time, we see that the mystery here is not that Gentiles were allowed to join Israel and as a result brought inside the camp. That was old news. That was commanded by God from the very moment he began creating a separate people by means of Abraham and the covenant he made with him. Remember God told Abraham that foreigners, Gentiles, were to be allowed to join Israel provided they gave up their worship of false gods and declared allegiance only to the God of Israel and as a ceremonial matter the males had to be circumcised. Rather, the mystery of all this is that Gentile believers did not have to join Israel physically. But somehow, they became part of Israel and of their covenants with God. For a Jew, this meant that a Gentile believer didn't have to have a circumcision. It meant they did not have to come under the control of Jewish civil and religious authorities. The foreigners also did not have to give up being Gentiles and instead become Jews. But on another level, a spiritual level, Gentiles did become part of Israel. And this is the confusing part. How is that possible? How could that be? To most Jews, this, this, was, uh, this line of reasoning was double talk. A Jew on one hand, but not on the other? How is that possible? Paul does his best to explain how this can happen. But it is something that even he, I think, did not fully grasp, and he couldn't express it as well as he would like to. Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 2. Romans 2. <clears throat> Romans chapter 2. We're going to start reading at verse 25. It's here that Paul addresses this exact conundrum. This exact problem I just explained to you. I'm going to start reading at verse 25 and go to the end of that chapter. For circumcision is indeed of value if, if you do what the Torah says. But if you are a transgressor of Torah, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the Torah, won't his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? Indeed, the man who is physically uncircumcised, but he obeys the Torah, well, he'll stand as a judgment on you who've had a brit malat, a circumcision ceremony, and you have the Torah written out, but you violate it. For the real Jew is not merely Jewish outwardly. True circumcision is not only external and physical. On the contrary, the real Jew is one inwardly. True circumcision is of the heart, spiritual, not literal. So that his praise comes not from other people, but from God. I mean, I, my heart just cries out in joy because of these verses. But it also cries out in pain because the church has thrown this precious, precious message right into the waste bin. We'll only spend a minute with this, although I'd love to spend a day with it. Look at verse 27. It is speaking to the one who is not circumcised physically. Who's that? Everybody in this room ought to know the answer to that question. It's referring to Gentiles called the uncircumcised by the Jews. Now immediately following those words, there is a qualification about this uncircumcised one, the Gentile believer, and that qualification is, and yet he obeys the law, which is better translated, yet obeys the Torah. Hmm. A Gentile specifically a believer, because that's the context of this passage, a Gentile believer who yet obeys the Torah. Then verse 28 and 29 says this, 
Under this transformation brought about by Christ, a man is not a Jew because he had a small flap of skin removed from his male organ. No, a man must have an inward change. It must be in his heart, which actually means his mind, as a work of the Holy Spirit, not of himself, not of other men. And if we stop right there with Paul's statement, we see nothing but condemnation for the Jews. We can even wonder if the church has indeed replace the Jews as God's people because now the true Jew according to those passages the true Israelite is the one who has the Holy Spirit in him meaning a believer in Yeshua Jews who don't accept the Messiah Yeshua are excluded but as I've cautioned you many times do not pay attention to the chapter and verse marks these were added by scholars much later after the scriptures were written and they were just put there as a convenience for our study. So we find that this discussion by Paul continues right on into what we call chapter 3. And Paul, being a trained rabbi, sets up the straw man. That is, he anticipates the coming argument from what he's just said. And so rhetorically, asks the question that any reasonable person would now ask. And then he proceeds to answer it. So, we've just read Romans 25 through 29. Now we continue right on to Romans 3, 1, all part of the same conversation. So he asks the question, well, then what advantage has the Jew? What's the value of being circumcised, he says? Much in every way. In the first place, it was the Jews who were entrusted with the very words of God. If some of them were unfaithful, so what? Does their faithlessness cancel God's faithfulness? Heaven forbid. God would be true even if everyone were a liar. As the Tanakh says, so that you, God, may be proved right in your words and win the verdict when you are put on trial. Mm -hmm. Well, now we're going to look at another chapter in Romans that gives us even more depth to this. But before we go there, let me point out another important dynamic that's being brought to light, and it's this. The true Israel, or the Israel of God, that Paul speaks about in Galatians 6, is a spiritual concept, or better yet, the spiritual and the heavenly reality. The earthly Israel that consists of humans and tents and animals and a tabernacle and rituals and ceremonies is but the imperfect physical shadow of the true spiritual ideal of Israel, which is defined as a nation of people set apart and prepared for service to God. That's what it is. Paul is explaining that all who trust God and accept His Son as Lord and Savior are expressing the spiritual ideal of Israel. And what scriptural, Scripture plainly tells us is that the very first people to accept the spiritual idea of true Israel were, naturally, Israelites. Thousands of Hebrews accepted this reality. Unfortunately, most didn't. But, and here's the big question, does that mean that physical Israel, and therefore physical earthly Israelites, Jews, no longer exists? Or that they're no longer Jehovah's specially chosen people? Does that mean that with the advent of Jesus Christ, that the spiritual ideal of Israel now replaced physical Israel and replaced physical Israelites has the distinction between physical Israel and everybody else that God first established with Abraham, then Isaac, then Jacob, then his sons and his heirs has all that become dissolved? Or does a Gentile mystically transform into a flesh and blood physical Jew like a caterpillar morphing into a butterfly when he accepts Christ. 
Well, the answer to all of these questions, questions is an emphatic no. Paul says in the first few verses of Romans 3 that the physical distinction between a Jew and Gentiles remains. There are physical Jews and there are physical Gentiles and it's going to remain that way. Being a physical Jew does have its advantages, among which is the awesome duty and privilege to keep and protect the very word of God that they were given at Mount Sinai. What a privilege. What an honor. So a Gentile becoming a true Jew is a spiritual matter, expressing a real living spiritual reality. But... Physical Jews also have to accept the reality of the true spiritual Israel in order to be part of it. And the only way this happens is the exact same way it happens for Gentiles. Trust in Yeshua. That's it. Those Jews who do not accept this spiritual reality, well, they go right on being physical Jews. And they continue being part of earthly, physical Israel, but they're not part of true, spiritual, ideal Israel. Here's the thing that's so hard for those who have grown up in the traditional church to accept. Christians have become spiritual Israelites, or as Paul says, his words, <laughs> true Jews. This is not somehow derived from Scripture. It's what he says. He says, on the contrary, a real Jew is one inwardly, circumcision of the heart, spiritual, not literal. So that his praise comes not from other people, but from God. Gentile Christians... You are part of heavenly, real, true, ideal Israel. This is a critical ingredient on the discussion of kosher eating. Because it says that whether we're born as a physical Jew or as a physical Gentile, once we trust in Christ, we all now become one new man. And we become part of an entity called spiritual, true Israel. Therefore, it cannot be that believing Jews, they have a whole different set of rules than believing Gentiles. It also cannot be that believing Jews are obligated to keep kosher, but believing Gentiles aren't. What is for one has to be for the other, or we're certainly not one new man, so now let's read Romans 11. Romans chapter 11. <clears throat> if you have a complete Jewish Bible, we're going to start on page um, 1415. So we're going to start at verse 13. We're just going to go from 13 to 26. <clears throat> However, to those of you who are Gentiles, I say this. Since I myself am an emissary sent to the Gentiles, I make known the importance of my work in the hope that somehow I might provoke some of my own people to jealousy and save some of them. For if their casting Yeshua aside means reconciliation for the world, what will their accepting him mean? It will be life from the dead. Now if the challah offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole loaf. And if the root is holy, then so are the branches. But if some of the branches were broken off and you, a wild olive were grafted in among them, and you have become equal shares in the rich root of that olive tree. Don't boast as if you're better than the branches. However, if you do boast, remember you're not supporting the root. That root's supporting you. 
So you will say, well, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. True, but so what? They were broken off because of their lack of trust. However, you keep your place only because of your trust. So don't be arrogant. On the contrary, be terrified. Because if God didn't spare the natural branches, He certainly won't spare you. So take a good look at God's kindness and His severity. On the one hand, severity towards those who fell off. On the other hand, God's kindness towards you. Provided you maintain yourself in that kindness. Otherwise, you'll too be cut off. Moreover, the others, if they don't persist in their lack of trust, they'll be grafted in because God is able to graft them back in. For if you were cut out of what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will those natural, be bran those natural branches be grafted back into their own olive tree? For brothers, I want you to understand this truth which God formerly concealed, but now He's revealed. So that you won't imagine you know more than you actually do. It is that, it is that stoniness, to a degree, has come upon Israel until the Gentile world enters its fullness. And it, that is in this way, it is in this way that all Israel will be saved. Okay, Paul says Gentiles are grafted into Israel, the spiritual Israel olive tree, which represents the heavenly ideal that Paul labels the Israel of God. Those physical Israelites who did not trust God, who did not trust that Yeshua was his son, they were the broken off branches. They were broken off of their olive tree broken off of the heavenly ideal and therefore spiritual Israel, not broken off of physical and earthly Israel. Jews to this day who do not believe that Yeshua is Messiah are alive and well. They're still Jews. They're still physical Israel. Paul is using the olive tree as but a standard biblical metaphor for a spiritual reality. That of spiritual Israel, which itself is synonymous with the kingdom of God. The olive tree is not a Gentile tree. It's an Israelite tree. Therefore, as Paul says, we shouldn't brag about our being grafted into that Hebrew spiritual olive tree. And we shouldn't imagine that we know more than we think we do. Because God had a very good reason. For, about, for going about things this way. And what was his reason? And what was his goal? Well, it's stated for us in verse 26. And what is it? So that all Israel will be saved. Part of the reason Gentiles were saved and included is so physical Israel could be saved. Paul is surely right. Gentiles have every reason to be humble. Not one reason to be proud, only thankful. So we can't escape the fact that you, me, all believers are joined to Israel. Spiritual Israel. Don't want to be joined to Israel? Too bad. You became joined to Israel the instant you accepted the Jewish Messiah. There is not there will never be a Gentile Messiah. <coughs> oh, there's going to be a fake one in the near future who will claim precisely that he is the Messiah of the Gentile world as well as of the Jewish world. And he may even be a Gentile, although he could also be a Jew. But he'll claim to be the Messiah. We call him the Antichrist. So with that as the context for our current condition as Gentile and Jewish believers, 
that we are spiritual Israelites brought into this condition by our faith in our Jewish Messiah. Let's move forward and see what Jesus himself had to say about eating and about what is clean and unclean. Open your Bibles to Mark. Mark chapter 7. I'm going to start reading at verse 14. Very familiar passage. Mark 7, verse 14. Then Yeshua called the people to him again and said, Listen to me, all of you, and understand this. There is nothing outside a person which by going into him can make him unclean. Rather, it is the things that come out of a person which make a person unclean. And when he had left the people and entered the house, his Talmudim, his disciples, asked him about this parable. Keep that little part in your mind. Mm -hmm. About this parable. And he replied to them, So you too are without understanding. Don't you see that nothing going into a person from outside can make him unclean? For it doesn't go into his heart, but into his stomach, and it passes out into the latrine. In parentheses, thus he declared all foods ritually clean. It is what comes out of a person, he went on, that makes him unclean. For from within, out of a person's heart, comes forth wicked thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, indecency, and envy, slander, arrogance, and foolishness. All these wicked things come from within, and they make a person unclean. Now, without a doubt, a casual reading makes this sound exactly like what we've been told by our church teachers and pastors since we were children that Jesus says here that there's no longer clean and unclean foods or anything else for that matter. The kosher eating has ended. Well, that's what happens when things are taken out of context and when Bible translator, translators editorialize. In verse 19, most Bibles will at least have the honesty to put parentheses around the words and thus he declared all foods clean. That's because those words don't exist in the scriptures. They were added as an editorial comment in med medieval times by theologians. That's why they're in parentheses. If you have a King James Version, for example, you won't even find those words. Those words are nothing more than an assumption and a footnote the Bible translators felt so strongly about, they moved it up from the margin and put it right into the body of Scripture. That's called changing Scripture. I don't think we're supposed to do that. They were wrong. And it simply reflected their ignorance and disdain of all things Jewish. Jesus simply says, food is digested and then eliminated as if the Pharisees didn't know that. And the context of this is that Yeshua was disputing the Pharisees who had created a new tradition of ritual hand washing before they ate. And they declared that if one didn't wash their hands in an exact manner that they prescribed, that made their otherwise kosher food unclean. This is a principle that is among rabbinical Judaism to this day. And further, as verse 17 makes clear, Jesus spoke this as a what? A parable. In other words, Yeshua was using a metaphor and an illustration to demonstrate a pattern and to make a point. That's the definition of a parable. He makes no other judgment as regards the nature of food. And as an example of how parables work, we're all familiar with the one about the seed being scattered on the hard ground, the fertile ground, and then the rocky ground. And about how at times we allow the tares, the weeds, to grow up alongside the wheat. Otherwise, if we pulled out the, 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 uh, the weeds, the roots might be entangled with the wheat, and we'd harm the wheat. Now, does anyone honestly think that in that parable, Jesus was giving a les lesson on agriculture. This is all about how you deal with weeds and wheat. Of course not. 
I mean, he was using the wheat and tares and all the various types of soil as an analogy on how to the various kinds of people in the world will receive the good news of the gospel and then what's going to happen to some of the people after they do. It's the same thing in Mark because as it says in the body of the scripture, it's a parable. He wasn't abolishing anything. Certainly not abolishing the concept of clean and unclean. So, go back to your Bibles. Only this time, back up to verse number 1 of Mark 7 where the context gets established the parushim the Pharisees and some of the Torah teachers who had come from Jerusalem gathered together with Yeshua and saw that some of his disciples ate with ritually unclean hands that is without doing netalat yayadim that's the hand washing procedure for the Pharisees And indeed, all the Judeans holding fast to the tradition of the elders, they did not eat unless they have given their hands a ceremonial washing. Also, when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they have rinsed their hands up to the wrist. And they adhere to many other traditions, such as washing cups and pots and bronze vessels. The Pharisees and the Torah teachers asked him, why don't your disciples live in accordance with what? The tradition of the elders, but instead eat with ritually unclean hands. And Yeshua answered them, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it's written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far away from me. They wor- their worship of me is useless because they teach man-made rules as if they were doctrines. Hmm. You depart from God's commandments and you hold on to human traditions. Indeed, he said to them, you've made a fine art of departing from God's commandment in order to keep your traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. But you say, if someone says to his father or mother, mother, but I've promised as korban, that is a gift to God, what I might have used to help you, then you no longer let him do anything for his father or mother. Thus, with your tradition, which you have handed down to you, you nullify the word of God, and you do other things like this. And then guess what the next subject is? What we just talked about first. And then, of course, verse 14 starts with, listen to me, nothing that goes into you makes you unclean. See, here we discover that Yeshua's entire conversation had nothing to do with permitted or prohibited foods. It had to do with this extensive list of traditional purity laws, in this case, ritual hand washing, which he angrily points out isn't even scriptural. It's a man-made tradition. To repeat, According to Jewish tradition, if a Hebrew didn't go through a ritual hand washing before he ate, he defiled his otherwise clean kosher food. His perfectly acceptable food now became unclean. To this, Jesus says, nonsense. So we can dispose of another story erroneously given as an example of kosher eating supposedly being eliminated. For in fact, kosher food isn't really the topic that's at the point here. The point is ritual hand washing and other ritual traditions of the elders that's all being shot down here by Yeshua. How many of you have been to Israel? If you've been to the Western Wall, you've seen these wash basins they have out there. You ever, next time you go, if you didn't watch carefully your first time, watch what happens. All Jews use a two-handled cup. And one of the things they will do is they'll fill it up and wash one hand and wash the other. But one of the things they do is they make a fist. Mm 
and they will it's because and they it's because literally if they do it with an open hand if they keep an open hand and wash it and then grasp it and open it, that doesn't count you didn't do the ritual washing right and so if you touch your food now it's unclean literally okay it has to be made with a fist okay this is what Jesus was fighting there are no ritual hand washing rules in the Torah it doesn't exist they made it up now they're saying if you take your perfectly good kosher food and you don't do our ritual hand washing rules you make it unclean and then when you eat it you become unclean and blah 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 and Jesus said you guys are full of baloney <laughs> you get it? Yes. now for those of us who generally advocate kosher eating as a way believers should follow you're probably feeling pretty good about things right now and for those who don't I suspect you're not well I wish it were that easy I, I promise you this topic won't end here but I, I think we need to end it for now I, I, I'd like to close with this thought the reason that God employed the entire clean and unclean pattern is it because it follows an established God pattern is one of, and is one of the greatest demonstrations of the Lord's governing dynamic of dividing, electing, and separating the things of this world. The Lord states in Leviticus 11, 47, that the reason for his detailed laws on prohibited and permitted animals that are used for food is to distinguish between the unclean and the clean. That's the purpose. That by defining of what is clean and unclean, his people will now know the difference. And they are to avoid the unclean. They don't have to guess. The Lord is all about separating. Satan is all about putting everything back into one big pile and eliminating distinctions. The Lord is about drawing distinctions between right and wrong, good and evil, holy and unholy, heterosexual and homosexual, saved and unsaved, male and female. The Lord established nations with distinctive languages. He divided and separated them with borders and boundaries so that he can use them and judge them accordingly. Satan is all about removing all those separations and distinctions. Right and wrong are relative. Good and evil evolves with time. No one is chosen by God. Everybody's the same. All sexuality is okay. There's no difference between the sexes or the roles and duties of each sex. Borders between nations ought to be erased. All people should become as one. One worldly nation. Sound familiar? God says his people are to be holy. And therefore they are to avoid the things that he has prohibited. Satan says there's no such thing as holy. Silly people. There's certainly no such things as permitted and not permitted, clean and unclean. That doesn't exist. Don't worry about it. Everything and everybody's equal. There's no distinctions among people. That's called intolerance. See, where we have to be very careful in drawing our distinctions is that we get them from Holy Scripture and we don't devise them ourselves. When we do choose to establish our own distinctions, that's when we get bigotry, racial and ethnic oppression, mistreatment of women and minorities, 
and all sorts of ugly results. The world is in the process of doing everything it can to put the Tower of Babel back together again. We're told from our government and our news sources, and now unfortunately many within the church and the synagogue authority, that God's intent is that all distinctions are to be erased on earth because that's love. Tell me that's not what you're hearing. This is a lie. That uncleanness is abolished is a lie. We're going to continue exploring this challenging but very critical subject next time. Okay. Father God, we thank you. And Lord, it may not be within our minds that are so far from perfect to want all these distinctions. It seems so good to us to just erase them all. To all be the same. No one's better than anybody else in your eyes. No one's acceptable. No one's rejected. All gods are good. All faith is good. But Father, there's only one faith that even counts. And that's faith in you. All else is a lie. All else leads to darkness and destruction. Lord, give us the courage to live and act in a world that is trying to break apart your ways. Give us courage and boldness, but also love to go out into this world and tell the truth. Father, there is no one that has to be rejected. We choose to be rejected. You abandon us because we abandon you. But Father, as you say, the branches can be put back on. All it takes is faith. True faith. A contrite heart. May it be so that every member of every family represented here will not see the grave before they have repented and confess their sin before you and accept the atoning work of our Messiah Yeshua. Blessed be your holy name. Now lead us in light all this coming week. Amen. Okay.